morning welcome to the last day of the conference i am martin i'm from university of genova i will be chairing this session on navigation and behavior we have some very exciting talks lined up our first speaker is helena kasadamun from harvard um hello and thank you um i think you can hear me well yeah uh so um thank you for the opportunity to give a talk here and i'll be talking about olfactory navigation in c elegance today um so this is c elegance here it's a little worm it's about one millimeter long it's transparent so it's a great model to study um the nervous system all the way from sensory input to behavior and i do this in the context of olfaction so my sensory input are odors and my behavior is olfactory navigation So what does this look like in C elegance? So this is what happens when you put C elegance in an um, odor gradient. So here in blue we have odor concentration um and then I put all the worms in the black dots and I'm plotting the track that they followed um and they ended up at the white dots. So they find the highest concentration if it's something that they like. So why is um the C elegance nervous system so good as a model? Um so this is um uh the worms are transparent so here at the top we can see a fluorescence image where each dot is a neuron um and we can record their activity um they also have only 300 neurons and they are stereotype which means that every worm has the same neurons they have names um and we know how they're connected so a little bit of background about how the elegans dual faction um so here at the top um i showed um some neurons that are involved in the olfactory circuit so in pink we have the sensory neurons um that sense chemicals um and then some other neurons that receive lots of connections from them um and this is an experiment that Albert of my former lab mate did um where he used a microfluidic chip to present um pulses of odor um to worms um so the stimuli shown um down here um and then he recorded the responses in all these pink um sensory neurons um so then when he did that for a whole bunch of um chemicals and at different concentrations and this is what you find if you do this um so here is a like um what sorry how do I do this a long list of odorants and here each column is a neuron and here we have uh, different concentrations for one of the odorants and each column is again a neuron um so he found that um these patterns are diverse um and um they're different enough um to each other that you can um decode both the identity of an odor and its concentration from just like one pulse um and the responses to one pulse of odor um but we don't know if worms are actually using this information i'm not sure if they need this just to um go towards higher concentrations of something they like or lower concentrations of something they don't like um so we ask the question of um what is happening in the rest of the brain not just in the sensory neurons Um so I did the same experiment as Albert but um in but instead of recording from sensory neurons I recorded from the whole head of the animal so you can see here what the head looks like um inside a microfluidics chip and you can see the neurons lighting up um so uh in this big matrix each um row is a different neuron and I'm showing their activity um after during six pulses of an attractive odor um so What happens if we do this if we look at the sensory neurons which are the ones shown here we find the same thing that Albert found so no surprises there they have very consistent responses um but there's yeah yeah like one of them is shown here um but there's a lot more going on so for example what is happening here there we see all these like switches of activity that don't seem to come exactly with the odor pulses however if we do lots of experiments like this and do some statistics um for different um odors we find that they actually do depend on the concentration of the odor um so there is something going on it depends on what the stimulus was but it doesn't come exactly with the stimulus um so if we go back to this picture um in these experiments we're actually missing the whole behavior part um because the worms were just inside a chip um they couldn't move um so uh we wanted to ask the questions of how um the behavior of the worm is represented in neuroactivity how it affects it 
um, and then how that is combined with uh, the sensory input um, and to generate the olfactory navigation. So then um, what I did was uh, these experiments where now instead of having the worms in a chip, we let them move freely um, the way they want in an odor gradient. Um, so this is a plate of agar. Um, we put a drop of an attractant in the middle, let it diffuse so that it forms a gradient, and then place a worm on it and record its brain activity while it's moving. Um, and this is what a video of this looks like. Um, we use a strain that allows us to both record neuron activity and also identify um, each neuron. Um, and we're using two attractants, the and isoamyl alcohol, which are both things that the worm really likes. Um, so, this is what worms do um, when you do this experiment. Here, um, I'm plotting some example trajectories for both um, of the odors. Uh, they start in the black part of the track and they end in the white part. Um, so we see that they get towards the higher concentration, which is the darker part of the background. Um, and they do that in many different ways. Um, so you know, we see that they all get closer, but um, they follow all these strategies. So during these experiments, we also have the brain activity of the worms. Um, so this is what one of these experiments looks like. Um, so here we have a, uh, all the neurons, which are these like three or four letter um, names. Um, and then at the same time, we also have what concentration the worm was experiencing and it, some measures of its behavior. Um, and, you know, the track that it made on this um, gradient. So a little bit about this. Um, let's unpack it a little. Um, so here, um, plotting some sensory responses. So here in orange, we have the concentration of the worm along the track. Um, and then these are the same neuron in two different worms. And we see that this neuron goes up every time um, that the concentration goes up. So if we look at the one on the top, um, we can see that, for example, it goes up, neuron goes up, um, and here for every, every time the concentration is increasing. However, uh, and if you look at the bottom, you'll see the same thing. Um, but clearly, it's not just following the concentration. There's some more going on. So the exact transformation um, from concentration to neuron activity is something that um, is, we're still working on. So if we, look up, if we go back to this, um, we see that um, most neurons, it doesn't look like um, they're following the concentration, they're doing something else. Um, so for example, I'm gonna point out, um, I don't know, this region here. Um, we see that there are a lot of changes in activity. So there are some neurons here that are increasing activity, some neurons here that are um, turning off. So if we look at what the worm was doing at this time, um, so it is this part of the track. So the worm was actually reversing and turning around. Um, and here you can see that like in, in red, the worm is going backwards, speed is negative. Um, so, and we can see that for um, different parts of this recording as well, that um, it seems that there are big changes of neural activity that are related to worm's behavior. So to quantify this a little more, um, we looked at the correlation structure of the brain activity. So um, uh, look each, um, square here in this matrix is the correlation between two neurons um, during the whole recording of one single worm. Um, and we did this for every worm, like uh, every worm we have a correlation matrix, and then we compared how different these are. Um, and if we look at here, this is a plot of the distance between correlation matrices for um, different cases. So in particular here we have um, worms that are experiencing either the same stimulus or different stimulus, um, which might be a different odorant or actually no odor at all as a control. Um, we find that these uh, matrices are basically just as different um, in either case. So it seems that uh, most of what is determining the correlation structure of this brain activity is the behavior of the worm. So to um, look a little more about how neurons contain behavioral information, um, we uh, can take one behavior, so in this case, um, I'm taking the speed, and try to predict it with neural activity. So here I um, fitted a linear model, so I'm just doing linear regression on the neural activities to get the speed of the worm. And you can see that it works pretty well. Um, 
with test data from the same worm, and here um, we have um, which neurons had the highest weights. And it turns out that if you do this for a lot of worms, um, the um, neurons with highest weights are pretty consistent. Um, so you can actually take the weights from one worm and test them on another one. So here I have the weights fitted on the worm at, on top and then um, tested on this other worm. And we find that um, it still predicts it really well. Um, so we did this for speed, it worked really well. Um, so the question is, can we do this for other behaviors? Um, so this is also still um, ongoing work. So um, in conclusion, uh, we recorded um, brain activity um, with neuron identities for um, worms that could freely uh, move on an odor gradient. Um, and then we can see that some neurons um, follow the stimulus and a lot of neurons follow behavior, and we are still um, working on understanding how this sensory information um, is integrated by, with the behavior of the worm um, to generate decisions that uh, allow the worm to move towards um, an attractive odorant. Um, so finally, I would like to thank um, my advisor, Arby, my lab, um, especially the worm team, and um, any collaborators and funding sources and the audience uh, for um, uh, your attention. So. Very interesting talk. Questions? Please. Yeah. I, this, when I say head orientation, I mean, um, so basically that the orientation of the, the, the angle between the head and the direction of the odor. So the worm sometimes turns around. So I think this is just the, that that's the, Priorities that we see. I don't think it's really um, periodic, but it, it does. Um, yeah, so like, I think if we plotted a different worm, the timing would be different. So this one just happened to be um, like the, the time between these happened to be more um, close to. Yeah, I think so. More questions? Uh, yeah, please. Do you have a, any? hypothesis or intuition about the shifting uh, when you expose to the odor pulse? Oh, sorry, what do you mean? Like, uh, why there's the shifting when you're exposing the worm to the odor pulse, to the square, ah, yeah, to the square yeah. wave? So, this, um, this is actually a lot, a lot of these neurons, um, when you look at them, um, we study them in other contexts, they're um, related to a forward or backward motion. Um, so a lot of people have interpreted this as the worm is going backward or the worm is going forward. Um, so it could be just like, you know, the behavior of the worm. Sometimes we call it the fictive behavior. Um, and these switches could be just like, you know, the spontaneous like switches between forward and backward, which is um, what the worm does usually, except that when you put them in a chip, the timing of these is different from when you let them move. Other questions? If not, let's thank Helen again. Thanks. Our next speaker is Amir Halutz from Weizmann. Yeah, so uh, thanks for the introduction. And uh, today I'm going to talk about a spontaneous formation of a stable hierarchy. And uh, now let's, let's see what I mean by that. So, well, th we could think of a social hierarchy in many different ways, but let me start with what I don't mean. So when I say spontaneous formation, I don't mean the case where you have a priori differences between the, the members of the hierarchy, and then it 
the only, the only thing that they should do is maybe discover these differences. Well, if we have a system with one member that is much stronger in some parameter than the others, well, of course, it's not surprising then that this uh, individual is going to end up in the top of the hierarchy. What also I don't mean is let's think of like a corporate where you have an, I don't know, an MBA from MIT coming one day and then um, being launched uh, directly to the managerial level or something like that. So this is not a hierarchy that I'm considering. What I am considering is a hierarchy that is formed in a group of animals. So uh, this is a, an example from uh, our experimental collaborator. This is uh, Tali Kimchi's lab uh, from the brain sciences department in, at the Weizmann. And so they, they put uh, five mice together in a, this enclosure. And well, I can't say for sure that they don't have any uh, a priori differences. But you see, these are, um, uh, this is a comparison between a lab and wild mice. At the beginning, it's not super clear what the hierarchy is. But then after a couple of days, uh, it becomes clear. And it seems to be stable, at least on the, on the time scale of days. So, so if you look at these uh, experiments, I'll just run this video if it works. Well, it doesn't. But anyway, these mice, they, they uh, run around. And then the way that they measure, and please remember this, the way that they measure um, a hierarchy in these experiments is that they track the mice, and then they track the chase's interaction between the mice. And then when you have a chase, you could clearly say this was the chaser, this, was ch this, uh, this individual was chased, and then um, use some ranking alg algorithm uh, to rank them in the hierarchy. OK, so um, I'll first going to show you uh, briefly a mathematical model that has this property uh, of spontaneous hierarchy formation with some uh, assumptions. And then I'm going to show you uh, briefly that uh, I'm mapping this to a physical system of active particles. But the advantage of this physical system is that you can actually compare it directly to the experiments, because in the physical system, uh, we can measure the same observable that they measure in experiments, which are, which are the chases between the mice. So this has the, the, the property of the, the observable, the experimental observable. So uh, there are a few assumptions. So I'm assuming that contestants perceive their own and their rivals' effective size, which I'm going to uh, denote as mi. And these are bounded by 0, which essentially means the bottom of the hierarchy, and large m, which I'm assuming is the same for all of them, is the top of the hierarchy. And you could, you could say it's different uh, for different individuals, but, but then you have a priori differences. So of course you could include that, but I don't think that's the interesting case. And these effective sizes are learned through uh, pairwise contest interactions. So this is the intrinsic learning rate, and uh, it's like a logistic uh, learning rate. And then I'm going to sum over all pairs. So in a system of uh, n contestants, we're going to have n minus 1 pairs. And they measure some signal that is the asymmetric signal between them. Here I'm taking uh, uh, a simple linear signal. So this is just the difference uh, between their effective sizes divided by some uh, sensitivity mu. And then um, another, uh, I think, a very important assumption is that the rate of contest decays with the effective size asymmetry. So uh, the more that they are different, uh, the less they are going to interact. Or in some sense, it's equivalent to say that um, uh, the intensity of the interaction uh, is going to uh, decay. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense, because the system, um, the, the very reason that it forms a hierarchy is to reduce the energy or the time that is spent in these interactions. So uh, inter interestingly, uh, you can show for any n that this model breaks the symmetry, namely that the symmetric fixed points where they are all equal um, is unstable. And then if the uh, um, ratio between these parameters, uh, m and mu, is large enough, then you get a stable hierarchy. Not just hierarchy, you get a linear hierarchy, which is stable. And here you see uh, the uh, deterministic dynamics. Here you see noisy dynamics, where you see some switches um, between uh, 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 close ranks in the hierarchy, which seems uh, a, a bit more um, realistic. Um, oh, sorry. So, and then it is possible um, to uh, marry this uh, model with a system of active particles. So, I'll just show you a short video. Where here you see these, these particles, they have uh, effective potentials between them which at time zero are the same. And then through learning, they will break the symmetry. And then you see that the chase interaction is generated between a pair of particles. And so I, I wouldn't go into the details. You can ask me uh, in, in the break. 
um, but it is possible to marry it in such a way that the stability of this active particle system will be the same, so I can predict the stability from the mathematical model, but then I have the observable of chases that I can directly compare to uh, experiments. And if you want to read more, not about this, because this is an ongoing work, but about a uh, how to uh, model contest in terms of active particles, uh, you can read, you read these uh, papers from my, my PhD. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. Perhaps one very short question and short answer. If not, let's, uh, let's thank Amir again and let's uh, continue with the presentation. Our next speaker is Francesco Boccardo from University of Genova. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so yes, my name is Francesco Boccardo. Um, I am a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Genoa in the uh, machine learning Genoa uh, group, Malga. And today I will tell you very briefly about uh, my ongoing uh, research project, which is about the role of communication in multi-agent uh, olfactory research. So first of all, what is olfactory research? Um, it is the problem of uh, an organism uh, of finding uh, the, the other source uh, in an environment where the olfactory information is transported by a turbulent flow so that the information will be sparse and intermittent and uh, an animal or an agent in this environment will have to develop a strategy in order to find the source of an odor. And of course, it is a vital task for many organisms that need, for example, to find food or escape from a predator. Now, in this work, I'm not interested in the single agent setting, but I am interested in the case where there are multiple agents or animals. And it is uh, well known that in this context, uh, there can be the emergence of very interesting uh, collective dynamics, such as flocking for birds or schooling for fishes. So this is a um, computational uh, work that I did. So of course, I'm dealing with a model. The model is fairly simple. It's a two-dimensional model in which there are two main components. One is uh, the odor plume, which, uh, is, uh, uh, which starts from a, a point, which is the, the source of odor. And then it is, it is transported by a turbulent flow simulation. And then I have my uh, group or swarm of agents that in this case are still, just to uh, show you the, the simulation box, but of course they will move. And each agent is able to um, sense the environment, so to have information from uh, its surroundings through two types of sensory information. One is uh, uh, the um, uh, olfactory information. Uh, these are called private cues because they are relative to a, a single agent. So the agent will be able to detect other particles inside a detection radius RD. And then the agent can also look around and observe its uh, neighbors, so the other agents, inside a visual range. And these, and these are called uh, visual or public cues because these are accessible to more agents in the group. Um, and then, uh, depending on the, uh, um, on the uh, stimulus that the agent is receiving from the environment, it will have a different behavioral response. So the response to the private or olfactory information uh, needs to be some sort of strategy that explores uh, the environment and then surges. So it goes in the direction of the other whenever there is a detection. Uh, there are uh, different models that one can use for this behavior. One very typical is called the cast and surge behavior, where the agent will alternate between a casting phase, when it is zigzagging in order to find the other, and then a surging phase, when, when there is a detection, the agent will go in the upwind direction. And then, the, oh, okay, sorry, and uh, this behavior has been observed and used as a model for uh, different uh, biological systems, for example, for moths. And then there is the response to the visual information. Uh, also for this, there are different choices, but one of the uh, uh, simplest choices that one can do is in just to use um, a, a, a model, which is called the Vichsek model, in which an agent will just try to align its velocity, its direction, to the average of all the other agents which are inside the group. So it will look around and try to imitate the group. 
um, this model has been studied a lot, and uh, it, has been, it, it is known to well reproduce the flocking dynamics. The model that we use, it is actually a, just a simple linear combination of these two models. This model uh, has been um, firstly introduced by Mihir Durf and Antonio Celani. And in, in this model, there are two main important parameters. One is called beta, the trust parameter, which weights these two components, so the private behavior and the public behavior. And then we can see that there is a little time delay here. This is called the reaction time. It's the time that an agent will take in order to align itself to its neighbors. Uh, I will not have time, of course, to go into the details. I will just tell you very briefly what are the main results of the study of this uh, computational and theoretical study that we have done. So just by studying the geometry of the problem, I can see that there is a little uh, mistake here, but just by studying the, the geometry of the problem, we, we were able to predict that there is an optimal trust parameter in this model, which is very high. It's uh, uh, around 90%. This means that the agents will try to align as much as possible to its neighbors, but still uh, retain a little bias coming from the, the factor information in order to reach the source in the most efficient way possible. Um, this, we, we can also observe this optimal value of beta in uh, a study of the performance. This is the time to reach the source, which is minimized. And of course, this uh, is in, in agreement with uh, what already exists in the literature. By, by doing this geometrical analysis, we were able to understand that this beta is not a universal parameter of, of the swarm, but it is possible to change it. For example, changing some of the geometry of the problem. For example, if we add a shift in the initial condition of the swarm, then we can move the position of the optimal trust parameter towards lower values. And finally, to, to conclude, we were also able, uh, with uh, um, a, an analytical um, study of this model, to write a differential equation for the velocity of an agent. And we can see that there is a, a ratio here. We have 1 minus the trust parameter, beta, divided by the reaction time. And this allowed us to understand that actually it's not just the uh, trust parameter, the important parameter of the model, but it is the ratio of these two parameters with which we can obtain this uh, data collapse. And with this, I thank you, and I leave you with, uh, if it works, no, it doesn't work. Okay, there was a video. <laughs> Uh, the, maybe if I do this? No, okay, sorry. Yeah, they, they, Thank you, Francesco. They should move, they don't move. <laughs> Question. Uh, meanwhile, can the next speaker please come forward? Yeah, please. senses is if I smell or I don't smell, I decide what to do. The public velocity is the response uh, to what all the other uh, individuals or agents in the group are doing. And this is a process that takes much more time than no, to the individual the response. Issue, asking, okay. so, you, so if you put it to zero, uh, that there is also a problem uh, to, to, to see to, to make actually the, the computation. So to simulate, you have a, cup, uh, a system of coupled equations that becomes very difficult to simulate. So the time delay is there also for practical reasons. Uh, I think his question is, what is the dimension of the parameter? One by a trade of the delta t doesn't have dimensions. So what's the thing to make the dimension? Uh, that's a very good question. I don't know how to answer. Yeah. It's. Um, I don't know the dimension of this parameter. So the, the physical dimensions of this parameter are just one over seconds, because beta is a dimensionless parameter. So it's a frequency. I, it's, it's an ongoing work. I have to say, I, I, don't know a good inter I don't have a good interpretation of this parameter yet. Sorry. Perhaps we can continue this discussion during the coffee break. Uh, let's thank Francesco again. Our next speaker is Nick Weaver from Yale. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so I'll be talking about information requirements and in insect flight stabilization. Uh, so basically, the problem is that uh, many insects are passively unstable in flight, uh, which means that they need to actively measure information about their state in flight and transfer that information and act on it uh, in order to stabilize themselves. 
And the question that I'm interested in broadly is uh, what information rate is needed uh, for them to stabilize themselves? And so if I want to talk about uh, stabilizing a system, I first need some model for that system. Uh, and so I'm going to borrow this model for the, the uncontrolled passive dynamics of the system uh, from this paper, Ristroff uh, 2013. Uh, and I'm just going to be looking at the, the pitch angle in hovering flight. So the pitch angle is the nose up, nose down angle. And so if we call the pitch angle theta, uh, we have this third order differential equation uh, for the passive sort of uncontrolled dynamics of the system uh, where these parameters, kp, gamma p, and beta p, where p stands for passive, uh, are calculated from things like uh, moments of inertia and so on. Uh, so these are sort of inherent to the system. And now what I want to do is I'm going to extend this model. So I'm going to take uh, this term from the passive model, uh, and then I'm going to add some things onto it. Uh, one is this active control feedback term, FA. Uh, this is going to model the response of the insect to perturbations. I'm also going to add on uh, some passive noise. So this uh, basically models external perturbations like the wind. Uh, and then the form that I take for the active control feedback term uh, is linear in the dynamical variables uh, with uh, this deterministic part, F sub D, uh, with these parameters, K active, uh, gamma active, and beta active, which basically define sort of a coarse-grained response of the insect to perturbations, uh, where I should emphasize that all of this is sort of coarse-grained in time over the scale, the time scale of a wing beat. Um, and then we're also going to make our response noisy, so this active noise term uh, is going to lump together noise in the measurement of the state of the insect, uh, in the noise in the transmission of information about the state, and in the implementation of the response. Uh, and then the, the strengths of these active and passive noises are going to be controlled by sigma, sigma active and sigma passive, respectively. And now what we do uh, is we're interested in uh, information, so we're going to derive a directed information rate from the signal that the insect uh, gets to the response that it implements, uh, where we take the signal to be the set of dynamical variables, theta, theta dot, and theta double dot, uh, and we take the response to be the active control feedback term, FA, uh, and then when we derive this directed information rate, uh, this is what we get, this is in bits per second. And now, it seems reasonable that uh, because information processing machinery in biology is so energetically costly, that there's some incentive for the insect to stabilize itself in flight while, being, uh, while using as little information as possible, uh, and so what we can do is we can minimize this expression uh, over the parameters k-active, gamma-active, beta-active, and sigma-active, which determine the response of the insect to perturbations uh, while enforcing that the resulting system be stable. And if I, take, uh, if I take the fruit fly as an example just to get some concrete numbers, what I get is that it needs about uh, 36 bits per second uh, in order to stabilize itself in flight. Um, and this is nice, but it seems that uh, an insect wouldn't just want to be barely stable, it would want to achieve some level of stability in flight. Uh, and so what we can do is we can quantify the performance in stabilizing flight uh, by the lowering of the variance of the pitch angle. Um, and so we can take one over the variance to be sort of a measure of performance and stability. Uh, and then we can ask uh, how much information or what rate of information is needed uh, to achieve some level of stability, so some particular value of the variance of the pitch angle. Uh, and so what we can do uh, is do this minimization. Uh, we're here I'm plotting one over the variance versus the information rate, where here this is the, the minimum uh, from the previous slide. And then when I do this minimization, now holding the variance of the pitch angle fixed, uh, I get these points. Uh, and so what you can think of is that this kind of defines a forbidden and an allowed region uh, sort of the, the best possible performance in flight stabilization that the insect could achieve uh, given the information that it gets about its state. Uh, and with that, uh, for time, I'll just leave my conclusions and just thank my advisor on this project, Ben Makta, uh, and our collaborators, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nick. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, th this is um, sort of 
hypothetically the absolute minimum you would need to stabilize. Um, but th this is kind of why why we do this is because we would expect that they would want to achieve more stability and they probably get more information, maybe. Let's thank Nick again. <laughs> Can the next speaker please? Our next speaker is David Zimmerman from Harvard. Uh, sorry, is the presenter view? Can, can, I act, can I activate that somehow? Oh, no, that I need that. Oh, it's all right. Whatever. I just have to time again. Um, hi, sorry. Um, yeah, my name is uh, David Zimmerman. I'm a grad student in Aravi Samuel's lab and the Harvard Physics Department, and uh, today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, some of my, my recent work um, trying to understand the, the neural substrates of interhemispheric, meaning left-right integration, in the, the olfactory system of the larval fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster. So um, to motivate this uh, briefly, I will just start by saying that like all, all bilaterally symmetric animals have to solve some version of the following problem, where you have two sensory streams uh, coming from the two, the sensors on the two sides of your body. Uh, and you have to somehow uh, merge them in order to form uh, a coherent representation of the world uh, in order to do behavior and, and, and respond to stimuli. So um, flies, of course, insects are bilaterians like us and also have to do this. And their olfactory system happens to be extremely similar to our own um, beyond just its bilateral symmetry. And so the question is, um, can, we, can we learn something about how this interhemispheric integration has to happen um, in any system by studying uh, the larval Dros Drosophila and uh, trying to use some of the wonderful tools that we have to, uh, to understand what's going on? So um, to be a little bit more concrete about this, right? there's also a good reason for doing this in the larva rather than the adult, which is that the, the adult fly has this quirky thing where the, uh, uh, the, the Sorry, the, the, the projections of the, uh, the sensors, the, the, or the olfactory receptor neurons, actually go to both the uh, ipsilateral and the contralateral brain hemispheres. Whereas in the larva, um, the, the projections are, are purely ipsilateral as they are in uh, uh, mammals and in, in most insects also. Um, and so this gives rise to this question of, you know, if the signals are arriving in two separate uh, pathways to the brain, what happens to them and how are they combined? Um, so now I have to go a bit, a bit in the weeds, I apologize, to tell you about uh, the, the olfactory circuit of the, uh, the Drosophila. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll <laughs> bear with me. So uh, the, first of all, you have these um, sensory neurons, uh, the ORNs in magenta, sorry, um, which are, uh, 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 the, the, as I say, the sensors and uh, project in the case of the larva in a one-to-one -one way to these, these projection neurons, um, which then uh, go to uh, the PNs, sorry, uh, which then go to uh, these uh, red neurons called Kenyan cells. Uh, there's this sort of sparse random uh, connectivity into this Kenyan cell layer. Um, the Kenyan cells for, are the, the intrinsic neurons of this structure called the mushroom body, um, oh, which is this sort of gadget for doing associative learning and memory. Uh, the Kenyan cells, KCs, uh, send uh, axons through the lobes of the mushroom body. And uh, in the or orthogonal direction, the lobes are tiled by these uh, two types of extrinsic neurons, um, these mushroom body input neurons, or M-bins, and the mushroom body output neurons, or M-bonds. Um, and uh, in the larva, at least, the M-bins and the M-bonds sort of come in pairs and form these, these nice functional compartments, uh, each of which has access to all of the Kenyan cell uh, information. Uh, and basically what happens is that the M-bonds respond to stimuli that the animal likes or doesn't like and reinforce, or that is, modulate the strength of the synapses from the Kenyan cells onto the M-bonds. 
Okay, so that's sort of the, the, the classical way of describing this, this, the feed-forward connections in the system. Um, but another way of, of uh, visualizing this is just to, to aggregate all of the connections um, between the various cell types uh, into you know, just, just one node each for each cell type. Um, and then when you do this, you get something that looks like this, where um, uh, uh, basically the edges in this graph are scaled by the, the, actually the log of the number of synapses between cells of each type. And the thing to take away from this is simply that uh, there is um, a massively uh, higher amount of uh, ipsilateral connectivity than contralateral activity in the first uh, few layers of the system. Um, and that really it's only in this, this, this part up here, which is the mushroom body, where you start to see substantial uh, uh, left-right crosstalk. Okay, so um, that, sorry, that leads to the, that leads to the hypothesis that um, you know, the mushroom body is sort of the, the place where this, this uh, interhemispheric integration is really happening. Um, so to, to address that hypothesis, the approach that I, I took initially um, is to, uh, to, uh, do, uh, to, to leverage the, the, the wonderful uh, transparency, optical transparency of our animal to do um, simultaneous uh, calcium imaging of its brain and uh, stimulation of its nose with odors um, in a little microfluidic device. Uh, and uh, in, in addition, uh, I can uh, create uh, side-specific stimulation by s simply laser ablating individual sensory neurons on one side of the animal's nose or the other side uh, in order to you know, restrict the input to just one, one side. Uh, and uh, this is what it looks like when you do that. So on the left is a, a single left-right pair of sensory neurons where one neuron is responding to the odor and the other one has been ablated. Um, and then this, is, this one is the, has been ablated. And then uh, uh, this is uh, the, the, the mushroom bodies uh, and actually specifically the Kenyan cells of the mushroom bodies. And hopefully you can see that there's this, this uh, mushroom body, the one on the left is showing these uh, odor, uh, odor locked responses and the other one is not. And in fact, these, these are from the same animal. And so if you do this more systematically with a bunch of different odors and quantify the responses, you can confirm indeed that the, um, the, the Kenyan cells basically only are responding to ipsilateral stimulation. Um, so, okay, this is, this is consistent with the, 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 the connections, but I'll also just point out it didn't have to be this way as well because although the, the feed-forward connections are, are strictly ipsilateral, um, there's you know, a huge number of, of indirect, you know, two, three, four hop connections that couple the left and the right side. So you could imagine that this might not be true, but empirically it is. Um, and uh, so though, okay, so then that means then if it's not in the Kenyan cells, then it, this integration has to be happening downstream. So um, I wanted to then study the, um, the M-bonds, the output neurons of the mushroom body. Uh, so what I'm showing you here are, um, uh, responses, uh, odor responses uh, that I measured in uh, several different types of uh, M-bonds in the mushroom body, um, again to this uh, side-specific stimulation. And um, the, uh, the interesting thing here, uh, so the first, the first uh, set of these M-bonds that I'm showing you here basically have very comparable uh, it, it responses of comparable amplitude on the, on the ipsilateral and contralateral sides relative to the, the, the odor. Um, but you see some uh, M-bonds, like these two, where there's actually a statistically significant uh, difference in the amplitude of the response on the left and the right. So um, with, with this, and, and this is also, you see this with, with multiple odors, not just this one. This is a, a different odor, and again, you see what's, a, a, you know, in some neurons, there's a this kind of comparable amplitude, but then in a lot of neurons here, there's, there's actually um, dif statistically significant differences in the amplitude between the two sides. So that suggests that on the one hand, the M-bonds are doing some, some kind of you know, consultation of both sides, but they, um, are, this is incomplete, right? And uh, that there's actually still information present in this layer about the, um, the, 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 in the origin, the side specificity of the stimulus. Um, 
and this also is, makes a certain amount of sense if you look at the, the actual uh, wiring of the M-bonds specifically. So um, the, the red arrows in this diagram are the, the, the edges from Kenyan cells onto M-bonds. And as you can see, um, many M-bonds are only getting connections from the ipsilateral Kenyan cells, although um, a decent minority, these ones up here, are getting connections from, from both sides, uh, left and right. And, um, but, but there's actually a bit of subtlety here also, which is that there, in addition to the, the, the red arrows, there are also these green arrows, which, oh, whoops, which are um, the connections between M-bonds. And uh, if you look carefully, you can see that there's some M-bonds, particularly these so-called convergence M-bonds, like M1 here, which are integrating not only input from the Kenyan cells, but also from multiple different mushroom body compartments on the same side of the brain, the opposite side of the brain, and from, from other M-bonds that themselves receive uh, bilateral Kenyan cell input. So uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity in this circuit. Um, and that contrasts notably with what we see when we look at the, the M-bins, um, the, the, in, the, the modulatory neurons here, where basically across the board, um, the responses are comparable or statistically indistinguishable amplitude on the, the two sides of the brain. Uh, and this is, holds true across uh, different odors as well. And again, this, you can kind of rationalize this, right? This makes a certain amount of sense. If you, if you think about the endins as um, representing some kind of reinforcement or, or teaching signal for the, the learning that goes on in the mushroom body, um, you know, perhaps it's, it's the case that you don't want to um, you know, convey a different teaching signal to the two sides of the brain, but maybe the, the output of the system nevertheless can, can be modulated or gated in some way to reflect the, the side specificity of, of uh, stimuli. Okay, so to unpack this just a little bit more, to kind of try to understand the relationship between the M-bonds and the, and the, the, the behavior, that this, the lateralization of the M-bonds and the behavior, um, I have done uh, the set of experiments very recently where I'm, I'm uh, expressing an optogenetic effector, CS crimson, which if you're familiar with channel rhodopsin, very similar, um, but um, I'm, I'm expressing this stochastically in um, zero, one, or two of a pair of, uh, of, of M-bonds, uh, and then uh, assaying the animal's behavioral response uh, to, that activ to activation of those neurons. And when I do this, again, I get a result that kind of uh, uh, has some resonance with the, the, uh, the imaging results in, in, so much, in as much as um, the, oh, whoops, the, uh, you know, you see some M-bonds, like this one, H1, H2, where basically the, uh, the, the activation of the, this, of the M-bon, even in the case where you only have one, one cell labeled, uh, doesn't induce any kind of asymmetry in the behavioral response, right? You don't see any bias toward the ipsilateral or contralateral side. But uh, there are also some neurons where you do exactly see that bias. So um, in the M-bon M1 and M-bon A2, when you, when you activate uh, uh, just one of these cells on one side of the brain, you actually induce a bias in the animal's turning um, toward the, uh, the ipsilateral side. Uh, so this is interesting because it actually it suggests that this asymmetry that you can see in the uh, in the imaging uh, may have real functional consequences for um, the, the animal's behavior and the, uh, the, the, the way that it may navigate in an odor environment. Okay, so just to, to conclude briefly, um, we've got the initial observation, uh, olfactory signals are indeed processed in these two separate streams up to the Kenyan cell layer. The um, extrinsic neurons of the mushroom body, the M-bonds and M-bins seem to be the main sort of substrate for, for um, integrating the two sides. Um, some M-bonds show bi biased odor responses. Um, the M-bins seem, on the other hand, to symmetrize the, 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 in the input uh, to, to the mushroom body. And uh, some M-bonds also seem to induce uh, a laterally biased uh, approach or avoidance behavior. Um, I'll just say the last sort of unresolved question here is about you know how does the, how or to what extent does the animal use this information for actually doing left right comparisons maybe for for navigating um, I'm currently working on an experiment that I hope will clinch that and if you, you're interested and want to want to talk to me about it later I'd be happy to uh, tell you more so anyway um, I'm just going to 
thank uh, my, my advisor, Arvi Samuel, and my co-advisor, Ben DeBevor. Uh, whoops. And uh, yeah, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Questions? If, if there are no questions, then let's continue with the right. with the next. Thank program. you. Our next speaker is Nicola Rigoli from Paris. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, thanks to the organizer and thanks uh, to the previous speaker that already introduced the concept of factory navigation. Uh, in my talk, I'd like to um, explain like, why the fluid dynamics that is underlying uh, factory navigation is very important. And then I will present uh, a realistic uh, odor plume generator to have like realistic time series of, of odor. So, Olfactory navigation, as uh, Elena uh, stated before, uh, is we are more familiar maybe at uh, small scale. They are like with chemotaxis, bacteria, or worms can navigate following the gradient and find the source uh, uh, of nutrients. But what happens is that when increase the scale, the signal is not smooth anymore, and so like it's impossible as a strategy just following the local gradients. But still, like uh, we do have. A, a large amount of animals that are very efficient turbulent navigator. And one example uh, of these are, are moths. And uh, uh, the, it has been observed like male moths can find females from uh, under those meters uh, apart in uh, a turbulent environment. And they do alternate these uh, two different behavior when they measure some uh, other concentration they move uh, uh, straight upwind in what is called surge, and then when they lose track of the other, they start this uh, zigzagging movement that uh, in the crosswind direction that is called uh, casting. And if we focus on, if we take a snapshot and we try to understand what is an olfactory uh, field, we will see something like this. And as you can see, like there is a, a source of odor that is emitting at a certain rate, and then uh, uh, odors is carried by the wind. We have a mm, mean wind that uh, is a uh, big U. And then we'll have uh, uh, the fluctuation that are much smaller than the mean wind. And uh, the ratio between the velocity fluctuation and the mean velocity is defining this uh, cone. And uh, the aperture of the cone is, due, is uh, given by this ratio. And this cone is where like the olfactory navigation uh, happens. And this kind of uh, uh, conical structure is uh, usually referred as plume. So when I'm talking of plume, I'm talking of this. And uh, if we put a sensor somewhere, or if you are a, an animal that has to successfully navigate through uh, this plume uh, in a certain position, and we measure the other concentration, what we will measure in time is nothing more than a time series. And uh, we can define some observable, some key quantities that are giving information about where within the plume is the navigating agent and how far it is relative to the source. One example is taking the average concentration, but then we can also fix a threshold, and the threshold is discretizing the other signal, and we can introduce other quantities, for example, the intermittency, which is uh, the total amount of time the odor is above the threshold divided by time, or uh, we can introduce width and blanks. We will define width like the amount of time the odor is above threshold, and blank instead when uh, the odor concentration is, is below threshold. And these quantities uh, allows like give information about how to navigate in a turbulent field. But like turbulence is uh, dictated by the Navier-Stokes equation that are three-dimensional equation for uh, a, velocity, a velocity field that is evolving in uh, space and time coupled with uh, the incompressibility condition. And uh, 
this uh, describes the evolution of the velocity field, but we are interested in how order is evolving in, in space and time, so we have to couple with an advection diffusion equation for a passive scalar, which is the other concentration uh, C. And as you can see, there are two terms. To the left, we have adve the advective, advective term that is telling us how the other concentration is coupled to the velocity field, and so how the velocity is steering and transporting the other concentration. And uh, to the right, instead, we have uh, the diffusive term that is telling us how these like, pockets of odor are uh, expanding at smaller scale. And then we have uh, a source that is specially defined in, uh, is specially defined. But like for this talk, we will not focus on this uh, uh, Eulerian perspective, but let me introduce another uh, point of view, like to think of fluid dynamics, which is the Lagrangian perspective, where we are, uh, we are putting our uh, system of coordinates over a fluid particle, par parcel that is moving in time. And uh, to do this, we can uh, uh, rephrase in an analogous way uh, the, uh, the concentration with this, uh, with this equation, where in particular P of V in the X prime is giving the probability of having a certain a parcel uh, in a coordinate X prime at T prime if it was uh, uh, at the coordinate X at time T. And to reconstruct the concentration, the concentration field, what we can do, we can uh, uh, fix a detection point, coordinate x, and then reconstruct all the trajectories of all the particles that are in that point at uh, time t. And to do this, we are just moving backward in time, and uh, um, the path, which has like a center of mass uh, uh, given by the, the, the location of all the trajectories is, uh, is enlarging in time. And what we want to know is, is this puff hitting the source and also like for how long and how spread it is uh, the, the overlapping. And so here there are three examples. If we are uh, moving backward in time and the puff is finally uh, reaching the source, having uh, a size that is uh, uh, average, then the, the, the concentration will be the average concentration. But if inside like uh, the center of mass, uh, although the particles that uh, reconstruct the trajectories is much smaller, uh, the concentration will be, will be higher. At the same time, like if the path reconstructed backward in time is not eating the source, uh, then the concentration will be zero. And so as you can see here, uh, we can reconstruct uh, another, another time series. And uh, this uh, kind of method uh, is pretty is general, can be applied to many different uh, uh, turbulent flows, but since we are interested in olfactory navigation, we will focus on atmospheric boundary layer, which is uh, uh, the most relevant for olfactory navigation because uh, animals in, uh, uh, in air are kind of close to the, to the surface. And uh, we can compute some of the observed the analytical expression for some of the observable that I previously introduced. And also we can see like how these quantities varies in space. For example, you see that the fluctuation of the odor divided by its average uh, is constant moving downwind uh, far from the source. And also instead you see that if we move in the crosswind direction, What's happening is that the fluctuation of the other concentration is, uh, is increasing. Another statistics we can observe, that we can compute uh, analytically, is how like, the duration of waves behaves in uh, what is the, 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 the probability distribution of this, and it is following a power law with a decay of uh, minus three half. And as you can see, like the agreement of the theoretical prediction and these that are uh, experiments, but also like free dynamic simulation are, are in agreement. And having the possibility of writing uh, this uh, uh, analytical expression allows us to uh, develop a stochastic plume generator where uh, uh, the user is just setting uh, what is the desired uh, uh, fluctuation of intensity. So it's setting essentially how open should be the cone, 
and then it can place uh, sensors that are spread within the cone and it will be able to measure the other concentration in, uh, in evolving in time. And uh, what I'm showing now are some results from uh, the plume generator for two different levels uh, of fluctuation, two different apertures of the cone. And you can see that uh, the theory that is in red and uh, the points generated by uh, the plume generator are uh, in good agreement. And this is also true if we compute the PDF of uh, width duration that again is following a, a minus uh, three and a half uh, uh, power law. And like the output from uh, the plume generation are these time series. Here you can see uh, time series at 90 meters from the other source mm, close on the center line or far from the center line. And uh, these are like uh, realistic uh, time series. And uh, to wrap up and to conclude, like I hope I convinced you that uh, the fluid dynamic is giving a lot of information to an agent that wants to know uh, how far it is from uh, a source uh, of odor and that this uh, plume generator is uh, generating statistics that uh, are uh, uh, according to the fluid dynamics, they're realistic and also we can do this pretty far away from the other source, something that is not uh, uh, possible uh, right now through direct numerical simulation that instead solve Navier-Stokes equation that I previously presented. Uh, and this is valuable for who's running uh, experiment because this signal can be uh, give as input to olfactometers or even used like for optogenetic experiment. But it, the, this signal could also be relevant for uh, in silico agent and for reinforcement learning simulation. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Yeah, please. Yeah, um, essentially, like, if you think to the path that is uh, uh, doing a Brownian motion across the finite uh, size of the source, you, you, you recover this uh, minus three third law. Yeah. More questions? I have one. Uh, how do you account for the, like, boundary condition, like, Closed, uh, not just the order boundary condition, but also the fluid boundary fluctuations. The fluid fluctuations change, right, as a function of boundary, depending on the yes. boundary conditions. What, uh, like for olfactory, for atmospheric boundary layer, I'm taking, oh no, wait, sorry. These are. Uh, I'm taking a correlation length that is uh, proportional to z to the height. Uh, so you have some yes. model as a function of, say, for the, uh, okay, I see. More questions? If, the, if there are no more questions, let's thank Nicola again. Our next speaker is uh, Massimiliano Yashki from Georgia Tech. Uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's a lot more scary to be uh, the, the one actually speaking. Um, so good morning. My name is Massimiliano Yashki. I'm a mechanical engineering undergraduate student at Georgia Tech and uh, undergraduate researcher at Dan Goldman's uh, Crab Lab. And uh, today this is actually my first uh, talk ever, so I'm very excited, very honored to be here, and thank you very much for the great opportunity. But let me start, otherwise I will go late. Okay, yeah, so the main features of centipede locomotion. The first person that studied in depth centipede locomotion was Cindy Manton in the late 50s to the late uh, 70s. 
and she made a lot of uh, really high quality observation and, and uh, anatomical studies on centipedes and what she found out is that centipedes have a phase difference uh, between successive legs which allows for the propagation along their body of limb stepping waves um, and depending on the value of that phase difference the, the, the wave can either be retrograde so against the direction of motion or direct. What she also found out is that um, centipedes that have um, uh, that exhibit body undulations, sorry, that exhibit uh, uh, retrograde limb stepping waves, they also exhibit body undulations. And she hypothesized that uh, you know, this mechanism was a passive mechanism and was actually detrimental. So centipedes, she thought that centipedes didn't really want to do that, but, uh, but they had to uh, you know, for, because of the flexibility of their body. What we found out, though, is that actually, thanks to uh, this great paper from, uh, Andrew, uh, from Bruce Anderson, uh, in the late 90s, we found out that um, this is actually not true. Uh, centipedes actively make body undulations because this uh, enhances uh, their locomotion capabilities. Um, another very cool feature, so we talked about limb stepping waves and the body undulations is active tactile sensing. Um, centipedes are basically blind, so they have to you know, um, sense uh, using odor or, or uh, even using uh, tactile information. But instead of just passively go around and touch uh, probing stuff, they instead actively sweep their antenna in order to maximize probing contacts um, in a you know, certain amount of time. Um, however, you know, from this video, you can see that all these videos that we made in the lab, this is how people used to study centipedes in the past, are made on flat ground. But you know, if you notice you know, any uh, centipede environment, uh, uh, natural ones, um, they are very different from uh, flat ground. You know, these are some ideas of where a centipede moves and definitely not a flat ground, right? So what did we do? Well, we would like to say that uh, we brought their environment in our lab and used it to discover new behaviors. So, you know, for example, in our JV paper from 2023, uh, we modeled the rugos terrain. We found out that they fold their limbs in a passive way in order to avoid obstacles. Um, and they adapt their, their gates based on their environment for example, they switch the direction of their body and limb wave in order to enhance uh, their locomotion on complex environments. We noticed, we studied swimming centipedes, we noticed that uh, centipedes that usually don't have uh, body undulations, they instead use body undulations in water and they use a direct wave instead of a retrograde, which, is, uh, which most animals use uh, for swimming. We also did some RFT modeling, uh, resistive force theory, uh, and we found out that because the centipedes have their limbs wide open when they swim, uh, the direct wave is the only possible way for them to go forward. Uh, we also studied lattices, uh, which is an uh, obstacle-rich environment. And uh, we noticed some, some really cool behaviors such as aerodynamic streamlining. Basically, the centipedes, they tuck their, their legs on their body in order to avoid obstacles. They twist uh, when, they, uh, when they are too confined and they can't use their uh, limbs and body undulations in, in a proper way. And they use peristalsis, this is my favorite one. So they move like uh, software, so, uh, yeah, airforms basically, um, when they're too confined. So they, they pass a contraction and extension wave. Uh, and another thing we like to do is robophysics. We think uh, to model, you know, uh, animals. We like to, you know, uh, think that we, uh, we cannot study what we cannot create, right? So, um, for example, in this PNAS paper, 2023, um, uh, the idea behind it is that despite this being a terrestrial problem dominated by isotropic column friction, um, because of the uh, you know, up and down motion of the lengths, which break and make in a sequential way contact with the ground, um, the system acquires drag and isotropy, uh, which allows us to consider this problem as a fluid-like problem. And from you know, this model, we made the robophysical model we made experiments with the robot and found out that sleeping is beneficial. Legs static friction contacts instead are detrimental, which is pretty counterintuitive. Another model, um, multi-leg matter transport uh, model, um, we used an analogy with information theory. How can, on a noisy uh, channel, send a message from A to B? And the idea is how can we uh, send a robot from A to B on a noisy landscape? We use redundancy, spatial redundancy. So we send more messages in information theory. In robotics, instead, we just use a lot of legs. Uh, and this we showed in, with experiments that it allows for reliable transport from A to B without any kind of sensing and control. Um, and then this is my favorite model. And it is my favorite model because it's my model. 
and, uh, and uh, this is a model of peristalsis. Basically, it's a robot that it's able, robophysical model that it's able to not only behave as a normal centipede, so body undulations, limb stepping waves, um, but also doing peristalsis. So it has these contraction extensions wave along the body. And to conclude, you know, we are making all these robophysical models. Some of them, though, are very cool. So a couple of years ago, um, uh, my, uh, my advisor, Dan Goldman, and, and uh, my mentor, Daniel Soto, they said, well, some of, you know, some of these models are really cool. Why don't make an actual uh, robot? And they founded uh, Ground Control Robotics, which is this. Um, basically, a swarm of centipede robots that go around fields, and they uh, search for wits and control the fields. And uh, yeah, and I think it's a super cool project. And yeah, uh, compliments to them. And uh, to conclude, uh, yeah. thanks to everyone, and especially you know all the centipede people in my lab. Uh, to be in my lab, you have to love centipedes. Um, and um, well, yeah, uh, especially to my advisor, Dan Goldman. I love Dan. Thank you very much. Uh, in the interest of time, we have to move on. Yeah. So you can ask the questions during the coffee break. Yeah. Our next speaker is Abid George from Princeton. All right, perfect. Um, okay, so we've all come, can you hear me? Yeah. We've all come here to the ICTP to talk about exciting science. We've all come from different parts of the world. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about behavior. So. We've been organizing ourselves in different ways. Right now we're attending a session on navigation and behavior. We've had an exciting lineup of talks until now. Uh, <laughs> of five and 15 minutes, some might have gone on for longer, doesn't matter. And you right now have to endure me for another 12 to 13 minutes. But of course, all of you are waiting for this, right? In, you wanna have your coffee, you wanna enjoy the weather outside, have some sweet treats. And of course, here, TS is a beautiful city. You've been here for five days. I went swimming, I hope you did. You might have gone sightseeing. But since we're all partaking in all these activities, you've been organizing yourselves. And these activities have different time scales involved. So we naturally adapt to these time scales and then go about our days. So if you want to understand if there's any temporal structure in these behaviors, then we want to figure out a better way to do that. And if there is temporal structure in this behavior, then there might be time scales associated, and we'd like to be able to extract them. So now you can imagine doing this with humans is hard, but we turn to our, we turn to our common fruit fly, the Drosophila. Uh, and here you see some nice videos of where this fly has been constrained to a featureless arena. It's moving around, they locomote, they groom themselves, they you also see proboscis extension, which perhaps means that it's eating food at that point. But what we want to do is to get from these high resolution videos to a, secret, uh, to a sequence of behavior states. So how do you do that? We have an unsupervised machine learning algorithm that maps body tracks, and you get behavior sequences from that. So what you see in these colors on top is an ethogram. You have discrete behavior states in time, and we want to be able to use that to analyze, or, or to be able to profile. And I want to emphasize that here we're trying to, the flies aren't responding to any stimuli. So we're really trying to find the underlying simplicity of unconstrained behavior. So this is a physics audience. Uh, so I don't have to spend too much time on this, but this is synthetic signal that I generated. If you want to study something that has temporal structure, the first pass is to just understand some some autocorrelation function, you, we all know we're trying to find, figure out some memory and what this decay looks like, but we can move on. How do we do this with flies? So at every time point, you have an ns dimensional vector. ns is a number of states, and 
for if you're fly alpha with and you are in state i, then you have a one in that position and then zero everywhere else. This is some sort of one hot representation that you guys might be familiar with. And if you want to find a correlation function, this also probably looks familiar to all of you, where this is in some sense just this recurrence probability that if I'm doing something right now, then what is the likelihood that I do a similar thing um, after some time, right? And we can sum over the states because we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily interested in the microscopic details of the states themselves, and we can average across flies to get better statistics. But you might have noticed that if you want to find anything meaningful in physics, we always take out the mean to be able to compute the connected correlation. But if you anticipate long-term correlations, this is trickier to do. And I'll quickly il illustrate why. So how, what mean do we compute? Because in this pr procedure, there are a couple of different options we have. If you were to choose for every individual, if you just compute the mean over the time window that we have access to, in this case, one hour, because we have one hour recordings, then you can just subtract that mean. And another possibility is that you take the mean across flies and uh, and then you take that mean and subtract that off. But if your flies have differences, inherent individual differences, then there might be some variance involved. But if you see that the two correlations are denoted by this blue curve and the other two colors represent the other two options, then you see that your correlations get distorted. They get distorted very quickly within a couple of correlation times. It's bad in the exponential case. It's bad in the power law case too. So we need to be more careful about this. So the point is that if you have long range correlations, you never really have truly independent samples. So as you can imagine, if you have a power law decay, your correlation at your one hour mark perhaps is just a modest fraction of what you actually have at a couple of minutes. So you need to be very careful. You don't really forget where you come from. And the consequence of the fact that you don't have independent samples is that you're, there's an overestimation of the individual differences that can be mistaken for long time, um, long range correlations. And as a, as a quick aside, what we're really interested in when, when I talk about individual differences, it's not that what you observe, if you observe two individual individuals, you see them doing different things. That doesn't mean that they're necessarily different. What you're interested in is that, interested in the underlying distribution that the individual is sampling from to generate those behaviors and whether those distributions themselves are different. And if you have a finite sample size and you have long range correlations, then you might not, be, you might not have enough time to probe to figure actually out what that distribution is, right? And here we don't have a theory for what that probability distribution is. So we really can't predict that. In SATMEC, generally we know what the probability distributions are, but in this case we don't. So, so the way we do that is by just measuring the variance across individuals. And I'll just walk you through how we do that. So for a particular fly, we want to estimate the probability that's in state i uh, for a given t bout of time t. So you just sum over. You just integrate over time for that time uh, window. And we calculate the variance across individuals. So you have the estimate of the probability. Uh, you subtract the average across flies, you square, you sum over, you take the average across flies again, and then you can sum over states because we're not interested in the microscopic details of the states. And now we can see what the behaviors might be like. If you anticipate perhaps an exponential decay, you have short range correlations. We have this intuition that the decay will go down as one over square root of t if you have, if you were to take the uh, standard deviation, but since we have the variance here, it goes uh, for a long time as 1 over t. And if there are individual differences, then you would get some sort of plateau, which is denoted by b. If you anticipate scale invariant correlations, then you will have a fractional power of t. And again, you get some b that um, represents the individual differences. I, I forgot to mention that one thing that's important is that when you make measurements on different flies, you can think of them as independent systems running at the same time or independent experiments. So observations on different flies truly are independent of each other, but the observations for different time points are not, right? Okay, so we do this with real data. 
if you have one hour recordings for each of these 59 flies, if you take a linear linear plot, you see, okay, this looks cool, but there seems to be some one over t decay. Does this look like short range correlations? But we can do better, we can move, expand our window of time. This looks like there might, there is still a slow decay here, but this might look like there might be some exponential behavior right at the end, but we can do even better. We look at all of the time that we have access to in this experiment, and you see something interesting. You see this somewhat curved behavior with very slow decay. And if you were to fit this curve with the relation that's up there, you can actually estimate what that B is, that background, that is an estimate for individual differences. And this is significantly lower than what one naively might estimate as to be that last data point, right, on that curve, which if you, because that's all we have access to. So it's, um, so yeah. And that's maybe a bit surprising to some people that you only have about less than 1% individual differences uh, across these individuals. So if you were to subtract the uh, B, now you can actually probe the scale invariant, uh, or you can actually plot this, and you get a very clean uh, power law. The scaling field has its value 0.18, uh, but okay, now at this point, so this is nice, but then at this point you might ask me, okay, maybe this process actually has a mixture of time scales. So you have this behavior, this complicated behavior sequence. It might be a composition of different processes. Each process has, um, each process has a correlation time, uh, and these correlation times might be distributed in some special manner. And this is just some mathematical equivalence. But this tells you that you can essentially derive something that looks like a scale invariant decay. And I generated a synthetic example to show you. So that looks fairly similar to maybe that. But that is not a power law. That is not a signal that actually has scale invariant uh, uh, correlations. So to do this, we probe the third moment of variation across individuals. And as we know from like other systems, if you have a true power law, then the scaling fields must be related to one another, and this is rather obvious here. The values are at least reproducible within two decimal places. And what's also astounding is that this power law spans three decades in time, which is all the data we really have, right? So that's quite cool. Yeah. Okay, so 10 years later, so I actually didn't do those experiments. I didn't do these experiments either, I'm a theorist, but. Ten years later, uh, we, Grace uh, and her team in uh, Princeton has been able to develop techniques to, gen to record from flies over the, over the course of days, even more than a week now. And uh, so we have the same high resolution videos, but of course, since these flies are living for days, we have to impose certain light and, like night and day conditions, so you just have bouts of 12 hour daytime, 12 hour nighttime, they're just imposed on the flies. But then we can just run the same analysis uh, on in for this new data set. So if you were to do the same thing, because we have much better statistics, far more data, I'm actually able to extract the fourth moment of this vari variance as well, uh, or the variation, sorry, as well. And you can, well, this is not the connected, correlate, uh, connected variation, but the, because that's a little bit harder to predict, but if you were to fit this, you can actually extract a scaling field that is, off, like, that is very close to each other, that's similar across these different correlation functions. And again, this goes back to the notion of having some sort of true power law where the scaling uh, is consistent, and in this situation, scaling actually spans more than four decades in time. Because note the x-axis is now in hours and it's going up to 10 hours. And in this new data set, you have two regimes, right? You have night and day. So what you can actually do is pit the two different behaviors against each other, run the same analysis. And you can see that the scaling somehow is different for nighttime and daytime. Uh, what's nice is, of course, that the scaling emerges, scale invariance emerges, but the fields are, of course, different. We obviously, we, not obviously, but we don't have an interpretation for what these values are. We don't except for the fact that the decay is slower or, um, or yeah, slower in one situation. But other than that, it's just that they're different in this situation. And, well, you also see that the behaviors are different. So 
this might not, this is non surprising at least, right? That the fly locomotes more during the day, it's more active and so on. Uh, yeah. So, in conclusion, I'd like to say that we've been trying to understand unconstrained behavior in flies, and we see that scale invariant correlations uh, come, like, appear, and these scale invariant correlations have an underlying scaling field that are consistent among different correlation functions. And with new generations of, with new data sets, we can actually test for different regimes, and in this situation, the scaling differs between night and day. I'd like to thank uh, Grace McKenzie Smith, Scott Wolf, and Josh Shavitz for the experimental side of things, and for theoretical discussions, Luca and Bill Bialik. Thank you. say is that if you were to think of the differences in the probability distributions, right, that, so if you're a fly, you're sampling behavior from a distribution, then you could say that the distribution differ from each other, the distributions differ from each other uh, across these flies, and that difference or that, dis that deviation is 1%. They're awfully similar. 1%, right? One percent of what? It's, I mean, hmm. not quite sure think, how to think about that. I, I, I can talk to you later. Yeah. Okay. Right. Here. Here. Oh, sorry. Interesting talk. I'm just curious when you look at all this data, uh, why this correlation should be scale free? That's just to observe that to be scale free, or there, uh, can you do some reasoning for it? Uh, at this point, we don't have a uh, have a good enough interpretation. There's, of course, like, uh, I mean, a lot of folks think about criticality, criticality in biological systems, behavior being generated by the brain, essentially, neural networks being poised at criticality. I will not get into it. It's still up for discussion, but uh, yeah, that's something that we don't have a good understanding of, yeah, at this point. Yeah. More questions? Yeah, please. That, that's a good question. So you do have secular variations across these days. So we, when we try to come up with these statistics, we choose days where we know that the flies are healthy, where the flies are doing very similar things. As soon as they start deviating, then you uh, can't really collapse all this data together, right? Then you can't average across flies and things like that. But yes, they do deviate, you're right. Uh, like if you were to, if like some flies die sooner because they just don't cope well or something like that. So yes, their behavior significantly deviates with time. So it's um, so like, for example, in my data, I choose the days where they're all healthy and doing similar things in some sense, yeah, yeah. Let's thank all speakers of this session once again. Thank you.